What a great reminder of how special our mothers are to us. Thank you girls for your singing and Sue for leading them. Good morning, my name is Sarah and this is my husband, Nate. And we're so glad that you're here with us this morning. And if this is your first time here, welcome. We want to get to know you. Let us know you're here by grabbing a free gift at the Connection Center in the foyer following the service. And to all the moms and grandmas out there, happy Mother's Day. Uh, and I just want to say something special to the sons and daughters in this room. Um, this is not the day. This is not the day where you turn your mother's words around and back against her. When she asks you if you're taking her out for lunch, you don't tell her that you have food at home. Okay? <laughs> Nothing like a dad joke on Mother's Day. All right, so um, our vision at Faith is to strengthen families towards a transformed community, and we invite each person who calls Faith home uh, to help us in, in achieving that. Um, we, we'd love for you to get involved in our church, and uh, if you haven't found a way to, uh, to serve God with your gifts and abilities here at Faith, uh, you, can, you can check out different ways and uh, different opportunities to serve. Um, just uh, check out available roles and connect with the teams at faithmuskoka.ca slash serve. And tomorrow night, we have a women's event called Ladies Monday Night Special. Uh, it starts at 7 p.m., and it includes a light dessert, some music, and a guest speaker. The guest speaker this time is Cindy Desjardins-Wilkins, a quadruple amputee who shares an, an amazing story of hope. The tickets are $5, and um, they're available in the at the table in the foyer. Uh, this is the perfect opportunity to invite a friend. See you there. And two weeks from now, we have our Kids Min Potluck Picnic at Camp Minioe. That's on Saturday, May 26th from 11 to 4 o'clock. Um, come celebrate an amazing year of kids ministry here at Faith. Uh, we do ask that you RSVP, and you can find out all the details at faithmuskoka.ca slash events. And before we continue with our service, let's take some time to walk around and greet one another. Happy Mother's Day. song this morning. Sing it out as you learn it. There were walls between us. By the cross you came and broke them down. You broke them down. There were chains around us. By your grace we are no longer bound. No longer bow. You call me out of the grave. You call me into the light. You call my name, and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens. Awaken me. Feel the darkness shaking. All the dead are coming back to life. I'm back to life. Hear the song awaken. All creation singing. We're alive. Cause you're alive. To the light, you call my name, and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. And what a love we've. 
sing that chorus again. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healing, awesome and power. Our God, our God. Sing that again. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome and power. Our God, our God. Thank you for your singing. Why don't you guys just have a seat for a moment and would you uh, pray with me as we continue in worship? Father, we come to worship you this morning, and uh, on this very special day where we also remember moms in our life and in their lives, Lord, we just, uh, uh, we thank you that we can gather together for uh, for worship uh, as a a body of believers here in Huntsville, and um, we thank you for the the vision that you've given us to strengthen families towards a transformed community, and uh, just pray you go ahead of us in this service, and as we, you know, as we continue in worship through our through our singing and the songs we lift up and the prayers we lift up uh, and the prayers of our heart that we silently pray and, and the teaching of your word, may you alone be glorified this morning. And, and as we continue in worship and, uh, uh, and through bringing our offering, Lord, we, we know that everything we have is, is uh, of you, is yours, uh, even from the very breath in our, in our lungs. And we just pray that as we bring back to you a portion of what is, what is yours, uh, that we would uh, do so with, with uh, humble hearts, with hearts of worship. That our worship, our worship would truly reflect what we know to be true of our God, what we believe to be true uh, of you. And uh, uh, as you look into our hearts this morning, may you see that, Lord, we pray and trust you for that. And so we continue now uh, by, by bringing our offerings. And uh, uh, yeah, again, may you be honored alone in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thanks for your worship. You can have a seat. I'd like you to take your Bibles, if you would please, and turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to look at verses 1 through 3. Ephesians 6, 1 through 3. Just while you're turning there, you probably notice the table just to my right as you leave. That's from Christine's place. There's baby bottles there. We've been doing that, doing this for the last couple of years. What we'd like you to do is take one of those baby bottles and put all your change in it for about the next six weeks. We'll bring it back on Father's Day, and then that goes to Christine's Place. And there's information out there if you don't know what Christine's Place is all about. It explains that to you. And if you're like some of us, you go to Father's Day and realize you've spent all your change on coffee and whatnot. You don't have anything. So they don't mind if you write a check for $500,000. They'd be glad to cash that check. I guarantee you that. So... If you take care of that after the service, that would be great. Let's pray together. Our God and our Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity of coming here today to worship you. And Father, we bow in your presence and acknowledge that you are a great God, that you can do all things, and that you've opened our eyes, given us understanding, allowed us to become part of your family. We're just so grateful for that, eternally grateful for that. And Father, we pray now that you'll speak to us through your word. May the Spirit of God guide us. Give us understanding. May we be obedient to uh, the truth you revealed to us. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. I'm going to read it from my Bibles. I'd like you to follow up from your Bibles, if you would, please. If by chance you forgot your Bibles, the words will appear on the screen behind me. Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Well, today being Mother's Day, as you've already sensed, we're going to be spending our time focusing on the woman who gave, it, the woman who gave us birth, who in some way, in some measure, shaped us into the people who we have become or at least we are becoming. And of course, it's never easy to express in words the value that we place upon our mothers. Nor is it easy to convey our admiration and the debt that we owe them by buying some gift that in some way represents our love. And of course, that has become a mar major part of the Mother's Day celebration. Um, I was listening to the radio this week and they were uh, going through a list of the amount of money that was spent on Mother's Day gift and I think the top one, if I remember correctly, was perfume, a bottle of perfume. And I think Somewhere around $4 billion is spent this day on perfume alone. And then, of course, there's flowers and a number of other things uh, after that. Uh, I actually went on a site that had multiple suggestions, gift ideas, as what you could give your mothers on Mother's Day. And after studying that list for a while, there did seem to be a pattern that emerged that, if it was true, it kind of gave me a weird impression of mothers, I must tell you. There are a lot of gifts, for example, that are based around the sense of smell. There were scented candles. They were, uh, I, they call these sassays uh, for their clothes drawers. Incense that was placed in a jar that was to make the room smell nice. Then there was a whole other line of products for the bath, uh, like handmade soap. Or I, I discovered something that was called a bathtub caddy. 
Now, you're spending a lot of time in the tub if you're using a bathtub caddy. I mean, this is something that fits over the tub, and I don't know what you put on. It's like a shelf there, and, uh, but you're investing a lot of time if you're using one of those products. I'm just telling you. And, of course, a lot of other stuff related to bath as well. Then the third thing I noticed is that the floral theme was everywhere. Uh, for example, there was a candy that was shaped like a flower. There were teacups with flowers on them. There were pajamas with a floral design. And so I came to the, the conclusion that whoever put this list of gifts together for mothers believe that mothers smell quite bad, they may be dirty, and for some reason they're attracted to flowers. Now, if that's the kind of stuff that mothers really want, then I think the best Mother's Day gift may be to give them a flower, some new deodorant, and take them out in the backyard and hose them down. That could be, maybe that's what mothers are looking for. But then again, I'm a hopeless romantic, and so I don't really know. Now, what's interesting, though, is when I read that list, and that was part of this site that I went to, and then compare it to what real mothers say they want on Mother's Day, there is a huge gap between and so I put together some tweets, and uh, for some of these tweets, there's more truth than humor, but just listen to what some of these tweets from real mothers say. The first one says, I'm not sure what my husband is planning on doing for me on Mother's Day, but I hope it's laundry. That was her tweet. Um, yes, I hear that, see that hand. Uh, let me see another one here. A Mother's Day gift idea. This is from a mother. Not asking her for money on that day. That's her gift idea. Uh, one person tweeted, when you have little ones, it's not really Mother's Day. It's more, it's more like Mother's 22 minutes to an hour day tops. Uh, one mother tweeted out, note to the universe, for Mother's Day, we just want to sleep in. That's what we want to do. Last one, Mother's Day is a special day when I get to do the dishes and yell at people to stop making siren noises while I wear a macaroni necklace around my neck. Here's one from a son to his mother on Mother's Day. Bought my mom a mug that says, Happy Mother's Day from the world's worst son. I forgot to mail it to her, but I think she knows. <laughs> I like that one. Well, we're celebrating Mother's Day. And uh, as you notice, I'm still sticking in the book of Ephesians, this series that we've been into for a while. But I jumped ahead to Ephesians 6, verses 1 to 3. And this is, a, is part of a section in the book of Ephesians that's dealing with how a Christian household is supposed to operate, how they're supposed to relate to one another. And specifically in this section here, as you know, it's talking about the relationship between parents and their children and so on. And it's a short passage, so just let me read it for you again. Ephesians 6, 1 to 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Now, most of you are aware of the fact that that's number five of the Ten Commandments. And it indicates that, uh, that there is a promise that's connected to us, a promise that leads to a long and satisfying life. If we honor and obey our parents, then our life is going to be long, our life is going to be a satisfactory life. Now, let me just say, I don't think that that has anything to do with the supernatural. In other words, that promise isn't, isn't, uh, isn't saying that God is going to intervene if we do this. I think the point of this promise is saying that when the family unit breaks down, then all of society breaks down with it. If we can destroy the home, the relationship between a child and her mother or his mother, if that relationship can be destroyed, then all of society eventually is going to crumble. I think that's what it's talking about here. In other words, if we want to enjoy life, if we want to maintain our existence as a species here on earth, we need to respect the structure of the family that God himself has created. This is God's plan. This is what God has put in place. Which brings us back to the focus that we have today, which is recognizing the place our mothers have in our lives, and now we understand also in the plan of God, because this is what God has created. 
And there are two things in this passage in particular that it says that we are supposed to do, as you know, is it says we're supposed to obey, but not just obey, we're also supposed to honor our parents, specifically our mothers. Again, I know this applies to both mother and father, but for the sake of our uh, emphasis today, we're just going to look primarily uh, focusing in upon our mothers. Paul says that we should obey our parents in the Lord. Now, that does not mean that we only obey parents who are following Jesus Christ. It does not mean that it's only Christian parents that we are supposed to obey. Nor does it mean that we're only supposed to obey parents that are walking in obedience to Jesus Christ. That's not what Paul is saying here at all. What he is saying is we who are Christians, those of us who say we are followers of Jesus Christ, we are the ones who are supposed to obey our parents. And that is a principle, that is a command, if you would, that is true for all people, regardless of their faith or regardless of their lack of faith. But of course, it's especially incumbent upon those of us who profess faith in God. Paul is saying in this section, this is the way we as believers are supposed to live, the way we are supposed to treat our mothers and our fathers. See, you cannot disobey your parents and walk in obedience to God. You're only fooling yourself. Let me say it again. You cannot disobey your parents and walk in obedience to God. You're only fooling yourself if you think that is even possible. Now, I have noticed in our society that there are groups of people who try to create a division between family members. In fact, I've noticed they've especially tried to create a division between the children and the parents. And there are other faith groups out there, other religions, that actually attempt to do that. And the reason why I think they try to do that is because once you have destroyed this basic foundational relationship, once this family unit has been fractured, then the children become susceptible to any other idea that you want to introduce. I mean, once you've destroyed this, this, this mother-child relationship, then any other thought that you want to suggest to them, they're going to be much more open to receiving and putting into practice for themselves. That's why Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8 says, Do not forsake your mother's teaching. Do not forsake your mother's teaching. We should be very wary of any teaching or any group of people who challenges the family unit. We want to strengthen the family units. That's part of our vision as a church, strengthening families towards a transformed community. We want to see your family strengthened. Now, I understand that we can only strengthen people on an individual basis, but as individual families or individual people in the family are strengthened, then the family itself is strengthened. And once our families are strengthened, then we can go into this community and hopefully have influence and see this community transformed with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it all begins with the family unit. We want to strengthen the family unit. I mean, obviously, nobody's going to give us the kind of love, the kind of commitment that we are going to receive from our family, especially from our mothers. God has structured the family in such a way that it's supposed to lead to our protection. It's supposed to strengthen us. And that comes directly from our parents. And to forsake that structure is to leave ourselves open and vulnerable to all kinds of dangers that exist in our world today. Now, I know that on Mother's Day, this is especially a sensitive area, and I do want to be sensitive, especially to the single parents in our congregation. And I know that many single parent homes are led by mothers. At least it seems the majority of them are led by mothers. And let me just speak to the children for a moment. If you're a child growing up in that type of home, then you need to take special note of this command that Paul is giving in this passage. I mean, personally, I can't imagine the kind of pressure that a mom in that kind of situation is going through. And I would say to the kids of that type of home, your mother needs your obedience as much, if not more, than two parent families. Remember, she didn't ask for this situation. She doesn't like it any more than you do. 
And you are learning very early that life doesn't always turn out the way you want it to. And you simply have to do your best with what you have been given. So I want to be sensitive to that segment of our society. But to all kids, let me say, obedience is not an option. For children, this is a command that God has given to us that He expects for us to put into practice in our lives. We are to obey. But legitimately, we could ask the question, well, what exactly are we to obey? Uh, Or another way of putting that is, what does a mother teach her child that God wants us to put into practice in our life? It's it's well and good to say that children are to, to obey, but what exactly are we talking about? Well, let me say before we get into that, that I think that many mothers are in a unique position to teach children when they are very young and impressionable. They can teach them valuable lessons that ultimately will lead to them being very responsible adults. You don't start teaching somebody how to be an adult when they become an adult or just before they become an adult. No, no, that starts when they're very young. You have to pour into them certain values, certain lessons, certain truths, so that they grow up with that, so that when they become adults, they're already prepared for that. Now, let me just say very quickly, I'm not saying fathers are not equally responsible, but I do think that mothers have a very special relationship with their child that gives them the opportunity to impart these values, to impart these lessons that possibly even a father doesn't have. And so what are these lessons that a mother is supposed to teach a child that they, in fact, are to obey? And obviously, there are very many. We could spend the rest of the day talking about them, but let me give you just a few. First, there are general lessons that I think all mothers want to teach their children, no matter what faith they're of, whether they have any faith or not. A number of years ago, there was a little poem that came out that was entitled, All I really needed to know I learned in kindergarten. Some of you probably remember that little poem. It was by Robert Fulgham. And it captures kind of the general lessons that we need to learn very early in life. Now, it's talking about everything I need to learn learn in, in kindergarten, but these things apply in the home, especially to young children. Part of it goes like this. Share everything. Play fair. Don't hit people. Put things back where you found them. Clean up your own mess. Don't take things that aren't yours. Say you're sorry when you hurt somebody. Wash your hands before you eat. Flush. Warm cookies and cold milk are good for you. Those are good general lessons, and and everybody needs to master them. But I think as followers of Christ, Christian mothers... I think we want to instill additional lessons. Some would say even, I would say even more significant lessons into our children. For example, faith in God is important. And that faith must be cultivated. I mean, if we are not going to teach our children that, where else in society are they going to hear that lesson? They need to hear it from us. Faith is important. And then once we have faith, that faith needs to be cultivated. We need to grow. We need to mature. But the sooner they understand that and grasp that for themselves, the better off they're going to be as they grow in their life. Another lesson they need to hear is God's Word can be trusted, and it must be followed. We need to teach our children that this is the Word of God that this has authority in our life. And because this is the Word of God, because this has authority, then we need to put it into practice. We need to follow these truths on a daily basis. Those are some of the lessons that Christian mothers will want to teach their children. Another one is prayer needs to be a vital part of our lives. That's a wonderful habit for a child, for for anybody to, to, to get in their lives. The habit of prayer, the habit of calling out to God. And again, the younger they are when they learn this, the more it's going to become natural in their lives. And we need to cultivate that and encourage that in our children's lives. Another lesson that we need to learn is that everyone, even children, need to repent 
and accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Again, they will not hear that message anywhere else. The best place for them to hear it is, is from their mother herself. I mean, they need to understand that we're born with sin and that we need to repent even, even as children and, and come and put our faith in Jesus Christ. And that's our hope of salvation. That's our hope of eternal life with God. And these lessons need to be reinforced over and over and over again. Now, I think as followers of Christ, we would say that those values, those lessons are self-evident, which I hope they are. But the way they're conveyed may not be. See, we teach these things not simply by our words, although our words are very important, extremely important. And we, we teach them not simply by sending them to church, although I I think going to church is absolutely necessary. But these lessons are taught more effectively by example. They see it in us, and they want it for themselves. See, our children are just going to copy who we are, what we are, what we think is important. They're going to think is important. And hopefully they're going to make it a part of their lives. good illustration of exactly what I'm talking about here is found in the words of the Apostle Paul when he's writing to Timothy. And he's talking about when Timothy was a young boy and the example that Timothy had. And the passage I'm thinking of begins in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. And Paul says to Timothy, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. He said, Timothy, you saw this for yourself. First off, you saw it in your grandmother Lois. Then you saw it in your mother Eunice. And as a result of that, I'm seeing that in you as well. There was a model, there was an example there for Timothy to follow and to incorporate into his own life. Later on, this very same book, Paul goes on and he touches on it again. Chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. He says, but as for you, talking to Timothy... Continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you've learned it and how from infancy you've known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Timothy, I know that you know the Scriptures. You've seen it acted out from when you were a small child. In your infancy, he says, that's been the example. That's been the model that's been set before you. That's why Timothy became the man, or at least one of the reasons Timothy became the man that he became. We should never underestimate the power of a mother's influence. It really is incredible. Learning to obey, learning to obey is a big deal. It establishes a pattern early in life as to how we are to relate to all authority. See, how we respond to our parents will be how we respond to every other power or authority that we run into in life. In other words, a child who listens to or obeys and shows respects to his or her parent will listen to, obey, and show respect to their teachers, to police officers, to bosses, and any other authority that comes into our life. You know what it's like. Some of you will leave here and you'll go to a restaurant or possibly you'll go to a mall somewhere or a store and possibly there'll be some kid there that's acting up. I've seen it, you've seen it. And the temptation for me is I'd love to intervene, but I know the police would be called and so there's no point in me getting involved in that. But you go, how did that happen? Why didn't they teach them when they were younger how they're supposed to behave? when they come out in public. Now, I know there are extenuating circumstances. I, I understand that. But we need to teach them respect for all kinds of authority. And if they will respect us as parents, then I think they will respect the authority that comes into their life. See, we are shaping, at a very young age, a life, and we're teaching them how to get along in this world. And if we're really going to enjoy our time on this earth, if we're going to preserve our heritage so that future generations can benefit from us, then we need to teach our children how to obey.
But you notice Paul doesn't stop there. There's more than just obedience in this passage. I said there were two things. He says we are to obey, but then he says we're supposed to honor our mothers as well. You notice he says, because it's right. It's the natural order of things. But then he mentions this divine law. Honor your father and mother. That's part of the Old Testament law. That's part of the code of conduct that has not changed. We know there are other laws that, 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 that Jesus fulfilled that is not applicable to us today, but this law still applies. We still need to honor our fathers and mothers today. Somebody has said, obedience is the action, honor is the attitude. Obedience is what we do. Honor is having the right motivation for doing it. Now, that word honor carries with it the connotation of, well, it literally means making something weighty. That's really what it's talking about. And to honor someone today, we would say, we want to give them a ton of respect. That's how we would express it today. We want to let them know that we appreciate them, that we place a high value upon them. We are honoring mothers today because we, we've set a day aside, we've set a service aside simply so that we can focus in on this one role that, that, that some women have. And what we are saying today is mothers are valued. As Proverbs 31 says, she's worth far more than rubies. She is priceless is what we are saying. Now, practically speaking, to honor our mothers means to be thankful for them and to assist them in any way that we can. And that's going to change down through, the we, down through the years. In other words, the way a five-year-old honors a mother is going to look differently than a 15-year-old honors a mother. And the way a 15-year-old honors a mother is going to be different than the way a 30-year-old honors their mother. But here's the point. There's no expiration date on this command. It's not like you, you come to a certain age and say, oh, I no longer have to honor my mother. No, no, that goes on and on as long as they are alive. There's never an age when we stop honoring our parents. One author expressed it this way. In a culture that despises both the very old and the very young, citizens of the modern world need to hear the lessons of the fifth commandment afresh. Commitment to the family does not end when one leaves home. This means that children, particularly when they are grown, must diligently work to protect and care for their father and mother. Never should it be said that saints of God just wasted away in quiet desperation and loneliness, cut off from their children. No matter what our age is, we need to honor our mothers. Now, obedience may be more obvious when we're young, but honor is something that needs to be paid as long as our parents are alive. As long as they're living, we will always honor our mothers. Excuse me. Let me close with this quote. It says, the Bible never states that every woman should be a mother. However, it does say that those whom the Lord blesses to be mothers, <clears throat> excuse me, should take the responsibility seriously. Mothers have a unique and crucial role in the lives of their children. Motherhood is not a chore or unpleasant task. Just as a mother bears a child during pregnancy and just as a mother feeds and cares for a child during infancy, so mothers also play an ongoing role in the lives of their children. Whether they are adolescents, teenagers, young adults, or even adults with children of their own, while well, the role of motherhood must change and develop the love, care, nurture, and encouragement a mother gives should never cease. And so today we honor our mothers. We give thanks to God for our mothers and the impact that they have had upon our lives. Let's bow together in prayer, shall we? Our God and our Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this special day that has been designated where we can focus in upon and honor the mothers that you have blessed us with. And Father, we recognize that we owe them such a huge debt for the love, the, the care, for all that they have done for us. And Father, for those whose mothers are still with them, I pray, Lord, that you would allow them to spend some time with them, whether it's in person or on the phone, whatever it may be. And may they convey to them the, the respect and the honor that they are due. 
And for those of us whose mothers may have passed on, Father, we pray that their memories may sustain us during this day as well. So, Father, we thank you for our mothers. We thank you for our families. And pray that you'll continue to strengthen them, that we may continue to serve you. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.